Okay, we are right on the hour, and I'm glad to be here. <laughs> and I'm glad that uh, that we're all here as well. So uh, welcome to uh, Let's Learn Supply and Demand Trading. So uh, give you a little bit, um, quick little rundown about who I am. Uh, my name is Anthony Navarro, and I've been trading the markets for, oh, about seven, going on eight years. Got introduced to it uh, back in 2013. As uh, one of my friends likes to say, I, I didn't know the difference between a stock and a rock. <laughs> you know, So if I could learn how to trade, so can you. All right. And so uh, it's one of the blessings now to be part of the uh, trading view community to give back, you know, and it's been great. I was kind of a, a lurker for a couple of years there and finally decided to start writing some articles and uh, they seem to get some good traction and I'm just happy to uh, be a part of this whole system. So I'm going to go ahead real quick and just turn off my fan. It's actually my portable heater and uh, I was having it on cool mode. So uh, thank you all for being here. This is uh, going to be interactive. I believe uh, we have a live chat function, and I'm keeping an eye on that uh, on my iPad here while I have full screen access being taken up by my keynote presentation. And, um, and my first introduction to the financial markets uh, was supply demand trading. And I was told, uh, really instructed, taught how the markets really work, that um, it's really not about you know, what a company is worth or a product is worth, whether it's like Tesla as a company or gold or oil as a product that makes the market move. But it really is these big institutions, these, these large institutions that drive basically the, the, the market forces of supply and demand. And, and we're going to see that if you're not already familiar with this, exactly how that works and how reliable your trading system can be when you learn how to trade using supply and demand. All right. So as I was saying, seven years ago, eight years ago, I started working in, in financial markets, just dabbled in them, learned how to trade futures, learned how to trade Forex, loved the leverage capabilities of it. You know what? 20 to one, 50 to one, uh, sometimes even 100 to one leverage. So um, that was awesome. And it's been a, a great, uh, a great journey. OK, so in a market, whether it's the financial markets, the farmers market, uh, the electronics market or, or the automotive market, uh, what makes prices go up, all right? So obviously, you know, teaser here, this is about uh, supply and demand trading. So uh, demand, all right? Now, when I was a kid, when I was in uh, grammar school, golly, 1983, so I, was, I graduated grammar school in 1984. In 1983, um, we had this phenomenon, which basically created the whole uh, Black Friday um, anarchy, you know, Black Friday madness that we we know of of today. Um, well, let me just double check. I think maybe our stream went offline. I want to double check that. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. What happened here? Stop stream. No, it looks like it's okay. Just double checking. Here we go. Okay. So for some reason on my iPad, it went out. So good. So uh, yeah, this was the beginning of the, of the madness, but which we know of today as Black Friday. And what happened was these, these guys created this uh, toy, this uh, Cabbage Patch doll. And the problem was the supply. They had no idea how incredibly popular these Cabbage Patch dolls were going to be. And the supply didn't match demand. So these dolls, which I probably would have, you know, traded, you know, traded, <laughs> uh, been bought for, you know, 30, 40, 50 bucks uh, for Christmas, people were black marketeering these things for 100, 300, 500 dollars, like in the parking lot. And, you know, if you were able to get, you know, uh, one of these things, like 500 people might be waiting outside of a Toys R Us with just 100 dolls available. Um you know, there was, a, there was a black market in these things. Demand made the price go up. We see that happen all the time. When there's a hurricane, uh, prices of certain things go up. Generators, uh, price goes up because there's a big demand for generators. Uh, water, bottled water goes up. And, and even to this day, as you can see, you, you could buy an original Cabbage Patch doll for over $1,000, right? Because there's a demand. You know, you can't charge 1000 bucks for something 
unless there's a demand. Like why can why can Apple charge a thousand bucks for an, a, a smartphone? Because there's a demand and people are willing to spend that much money. All right. So the next question is what makes prices go down? All right. So what makes prices go down in a market is the same thing. Supply. All right. Or really the opposite of that, you know, two edged uh, coin there is is supply. And we saw that happen recently. Wine prices are beginning to drop because uh, we have excess grapes. All right. And, and they think that one of their problems that they did was uh, they they did not market to millennials properly. And so there's a glut of wine. There's an abundance uh, of wine out there that is uh, exceeding um, supply demand. So now there's a glut. They're trying to get it off their shelves. So what do they do? They have to lower the price. And so bottles that I used to spend 30 bucks on, like um, uh, estimated guests or um, uh, this one right here, Carnivore, you know, one of my favorite wines is sitting actually right there, Carnivore. These used to be 30 bucks a bottle and now I can get it for 12. All right. So when you get a surplus of something and a slowdown in the purchasing of it, uh, grocery stores don't want to become warehouses. They want to move product and move it off their shelves. And the only way they're going to do that is if they lower prices. Likewise, we saw oil. Uh, oil dropped uh, 20%. And uh, that excess supply of crude oil uh, is just sitting there because no one wants any. And it's not that no one wants any, but we're stuck in COVID land, right? People are stuck at home. We're not using oil, all right? So that's the problem there. And that's what causes prices to go down, uh, the converse of uh, prices going up. And of course, uh, something's going on outside as soon as we're getting ready to do a presentation. So uh, pardon that. All right. So whether it's the Beanie Baby market, the Cabbage Patch market, um, or the financial market, a product is a product is a product. All right. So whether it's a company, a commodity, or a currency. Okay. Yeah. Appreciate you guys telling me that. Uh, yeah. Appreciate you telling me that. So I am watching the live chat. So if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to um, go ahead and uh, and uh, chime in over there. Appreciate that, Mr. Professor, the only Professor X. <laughs> so I don't know if you are old enough to remember who all is watching uh, this live stream, but um, when you go to Wall Street or Chicago, you know, they'd, ha they'd have these trading pits, which were absolutely insane. You know, these people are yelling and screaming. And, and if you saw um, movies like uh, Trading Places, you, you'd see these guys, you know, freaking out and trying to sell stuff. They're selling orange juice futures. They're raising their hand. They're yelling. They're shouting. They're making a spectacle of themselves because what are they trying to do? They're trying to buy inventory to fill up their, quote, quote, uh, shelves so that they can then sell it to the world. So they need to bring inventory in and then sell inventory out. And how does the only way you make money in any market is when you buy that inventory at a wholesale price and then you mark it up and you sell that inventory at a retail price, okay? So that's the one of the big myths and one of the big brain dumps that that people have the biggest difficulty understanding, thinking that the financial markets are this big mystery machine is some wild black box. It's like, you gotta be the Wizard of Oz behind the green curtain. And you realize all this is, is buying and selling inventory, except we have an advantage. We don't need a store. We don't have to uh, physically warehouse any of this inventory. We don't have to find customers. All we have to do is press buttons on our computer, all right? Now, the reason prices move up and down in, in any market is because there's always a finite amount of product. I see what's going on out there. It's uh, it's leaf time. So these guys are sucking up the leaves on the side of the curve. So excuse me again for that. <laughs> uh, so when there's a finite amount of product, you, sorry, you have only so many people to share that product. Now, if, if, if you go to an automotive dealer and they've only got two of these cars left that has have had a lot of demand, they can jack the price up because there's only so many X to go around. Now, when you're talking about the financial markets, you're talking trillions of dollars in Forex, billions of dollars in futures, hundreds of millions of dollars 
of stocks every day that get traded. And even though there's so much volume, there's only so much to go around. And so when there's a big demand for something, so all of a sudden Tesla, you know, becomes the hot thing. People have a great demand for it. It brings prices up. When people don't want to get involved in something like hotels and airlines and Airbnb uh, right now, prices go down. All right. So when there's a big inventory that no one wants to buy, prices go down. And when there's a, a, a scarcity or a limit of inventory that a lot of people want to buy, prices go up. So on the floor of those exchanges back in the day before we, uh, which I think we live in the, in the greatest period of history when it comes to trading, is that we just press buttons. But, but there's this great movie, that, which you can watch for free on YouTube if you see down there in the bottom right hand corner, The Pit. Just search for The Pit in YouTube, and it's this incredible movie watching how these guys did this. They were buying cocoa and cotton and coffee and, and all these different commodities. And what they're doing is, you know, you'd have some people sitting on that floor saying, you know, hey, I'm looking for someone selling a 25. I want to buy cocoa, coffee, whatever, at $25. And this guy over here says, hey, man, I got coffee. I'm willing to sell it to you for 25 because he must have bought it at 20 this guy who's buying it at 25 is probably going to jack it up and sell it for 30 and so on. All right. So at the end of the day, when the bell goes ding at uh, four o'clock uh, in the afternoon, then comes the job of the order clerk, this poor guy. All right. So this poor guy, when we were dealing with all that paper, this poor guy had to then enter every single one of those buy and sell orders. So these guys would be taking orders, taking orders, taking orders, taking orders, and, and then the clerks at the end of the day have to stay late and they have to process all these all these orders, all right? Now, this guy is lucky enough that he has himself a computer, all right? <laughs> Before that, you didn't even have a computer. They took all those pieces of paper and they brought it into a back room, all right? And in the back room, this poor order clerk then had to sort all these orders out by price, all right? So he would lay out all the orders and then he had to do some matchmaking. He'd say, oh, okay, someone wanted to um, buy something for $49.60, $49 and someone else wanted to sell something for $49.60, and he'd then make, make a match. He'd take those two pieces of paper and staple them, and then basically that becomes volume, which goes right into the circular file. Because <laughs> how many of you save a receipt when you go to you know Starbucks or save a receipt when you go to uh, Burger King? You know, nothing. So once you go click those two orders, basically, which are unfilled supply and demand become filled and a filled order is basically garbage. All right. So that's what, what happens. Those orders all get processed. Now, what happens, what, what's going on here is he sorts all that out by price. And this, this order clerk can actually find out where the market is going to move each day. Because somewhere along the process of that day, an institution is going to say, I want to buy something. And institutions like Schwab or Merrill um, and uh, Bank of America, I mean, they buy in bulk, right? You know, we think we buy in bulk when we go to Costco or BJ's or Sam's Club and stuff like that. But these guys buy in the millions of shares or tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars of contracts, um, or we know in the Forex market, trillions in, in currency. Right. So when you when you place an order like that, it leaves a dent. You know, it's not like skipping a rock across a pond. It's like throwing in a boulder and it makes a dent. All right. So what would happen is when he would lay out all these orders, he would say, hey, here's IBM. IBM opened up today for 50 bucks. So IBM's trading for 50 bucks, say. And you'd have a Schwab or a Merrill come in and say, yeah, I'd like to buy some IBM. I'd like to put IBM in my inventory and I'll sell that uh, IBM to my customers but I don't want to pay the market price. No, who wants to pay market price? You know, whoever goes to Costco and wants to pay the upfront price, who, who goes to the auto dealer and wants to pay the manufactured suggested retail price? I want to buy that thing on sale, all right? So your Merrill's, your Schwab's, your everything, they put in this big order and say, I'm going to be patient. I'm going to wait until price comes to, in this case, not 50 bucks. I'm going to wait until it comes to 49.60. And when that, order, when that price comes down here, buy me a million shares. And what happens is they have a big pile of orders to say, buy me a million shares because 
what happens is you don't have one piece of paper saying, buy me a million shares. You have to say, buy a thousand, buy 50, buy a hundred, buy 10, buy one, because they have to buy it from other individuals. They have to exchange that value uh, with the people that have the amount of product that they want to buy to exchange. And, and that's why it's called the stock exchange and the futures exchange and the Forex exchange is because it's just a bunch of buyers and sellers exchanging and they're exchanging however many, you know, contracts or however many shares or however many uh, units worth of product that's being sold. All right. So, so let's say that it's IBM that's going on for sale. All right. So IBM is the product just like apples or uh, just like uh, um, Toyotas or just like a, an iPad uh, IBM's for sale and IBM's for 50 bucks. So um, it comes in and then they, then they, then they tell their, their broker, okay, uh, buy us a million shares of IBM at wholesale. They know in advance then, just like a grocery store, right? So go back, go back to the, the grocery store metaphor or the Amazon metaphor or the, the Walmart metaphor. They know when they're going to put a product on their shelves, they're going to buy it at one price and they know in advance where they want to sell it. So if, if it's Amazon or just say if it's Walmart, if they're buying um, Hot Wheels and they're, and they're buying Hot Wheels for uh, a buck a piece, they know that they're going to sell those Hot Wheels to those kids for three bucks a piece. Or if they sell tires, they're going to sell tires, they're going to buy those tires at uh, $100 per tire, they're going to sell it to their customers for what? <laughs> 225 per customer, All right? So just like Amazon, just like Walmart, just like your local grocery store, so goes these financial institutions. They'll buy IBM, they'll buy crude oil, they'll buy um, Tesla at a wholesale price. And that demand, that massive amount of demand because they're not buying 50 shares, 100 shares. They're buying 500,000 shares. They're buying 10,000 contracts. That demand is going to push price and push price and push price, just like demand for any other product into the level that they want to then sell it at. All right. So in a sense, this could be called market manipulation, but it's just the way markets work. You know, and, and they, yes, they manipulate the market every day and we, we love them for it because price movement is the only way that you and I as traders can make money because we can't move the market when we buy five contracts or we buy 50 shares. We need to, you know, like, <laughs> like Dr. Evil go, I want 1 million shares, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know? And that million shares is going to move the market. All right, so we need to start thinking like institutions when we trade. Now, the reason I show this example with these piles of orders back in the day when people used to do all this on paper on the floors of the New York Stock Exchange or the Chicago Exchange and, and the ICE Exchange and all that is because these piles of paper, if we think of these orders, directly reflect like a mirror price action on a chart. And that's why we get to follow the money. There, there's the old adage, uh, which we've probably heard a lot right now, right recently uh, with this whole presidential election. Uh, if you want to see corruption, follow the money. All right, Corruption in politics, follow the money. If you want to see what Schwab is doing, what Merrill is doing, what Bank of America is doing, what your broker is doing, we follow the money. All right. So we think of that analogy again, that if there's a pile of orders that they want to buy and a pile of orders where they want to sell, um, those ranges are going to leave a dent on the chart. So in this example, we're going to see that when we see an explosive move in price, we see it move from, you know, $49 to $57 in, in a very, very short period of time. We're going to say, wow, um, what caused that? So you can go to Forex Factory or, you know, one of those services that says, oh yeah, 1030, the oil uh, reserve price was coming out or at, at 11 o'clock, the Fed was going to say something. But if it, uh, barring news events or geopolitical events, if we see something like that happen all by itself, we're going to say, I bet you, I bet you there's a high probability that that was an institution that wanted to buy a lot of product at wholesale, driving the price of that product up. All right. Then 
what we're going to see after that is we're going to see the converse reaction. We're going to see that price hits a level of what we call supply or retail pricing. And we're going to see that same ballistic move down. And we're also going to see that these orders, well, we can't see it because it happens behind closed doors. It actually now happens all you know in the computer. We're going to see these orders getting chewed up. So what used to be this big pile here, when price came into this level, it chewed up some of those orders. And now we only have this many orders. So when we see these levels of supply and demand, we ask ourselves those two questions. The first question was, was this an institutional buy order where I had the potential to, to potentiality to buy or sell? The second question is, what are the odds that there are still orders in that pile? Because as long as there's orders in that pile, price can't get any lower because they want to buy. There's still a demand. You know, price isn't going to go below 50 bucks if they're willing to pay 50 bucks for it. I'm not going to bring price down to $45 if someone's willing to pay 50 bucks for it, right? So all those orders have to go to zero in order for price to go from 50 to 49.99. So we get to look at those charts and with a high degree of accuracy by seeing these moves, say, if that was an institutional move, I get to buy it again and buy it again and buy it again until all of these orders are exhausted. And then if I can guess that this was an institutional move to sell, I get to sell it again and sell it again and sell it again until all of those orders have been exhausted. All right. So it's really interesting to look at the physicality of what used to happen on the floors of these exchanges when uh, now we can look at it on the chart. Because now what happens in, in this example? We do see in this example that price does come to this level of demand again. We see that there is still a demand for that product at that price. We see the ballistic move up. We see these orders uh, getting chewed up. And we get to do that again and again and again until all of those orders become exhausted. So the magic of supply and demand or the, the, the mystery or the demystification of supply and demand is all we need to know to become a profitable, productive trader is to look at the charts. If you notice here, I didn't use MACD. I didn't use volume. I didn't use RSI. All we need to look at is price action because the prices are the footprints of where those piles of orders are. Now we have to basically become experts at pattern recognition because these patterns just don't happen everywhere. I mean, they do happen everywhere, but we got to determine which ones are institutional orders and, and which ones are not. So that we can, with a high degree of probability, look at a chart in this example and say, wow, look at that ballistic move out. Hmm. Let's say that there was a hundred thousand shares that uh, Bank of America wanted to buy. So. When price moves out, they may have only processed 20,000 orders. So there's another 80,000 orders sitting in here. So I would go ahead and place a buy order in that zone and then place a stop right below it and then set my target to be somewhere where I think price is going to run, where I'm going to see hopefully a ballistic move down. Uh, great question, Dan. So Danville 101 asks, how often does supply and demand happen in opposition to support and resistance? It is actually the opposite. And that's really a very good question because what happens when you use an indicator? An indicator only can tell you what has happened to the price of the product in the past. So we call it lagging indicators or lagging data. And that's why we have to look at the chart to estimate with a high degree of probability, what's going to happen in the future? So if I see this move out, you know, what happens a lot of times, you'll have novice traders start buying. Like, oh, I don't want to miss out on this move. Oh, I, I need to get in and I need to buy. And they buy here. And then what happens? They get stopped out. So we can't chase price. We can't use indicators because I, I don't need something that told me what price did. I want something that's going to tell me what price is going to do. Now, in the question of support and resistance, um, the, the tra traditional uh, form of, of support, I'm sorry, uh, uh, yeah, support, is say price comes back down to this level. Support will say, oh, I see one hit, 
I see two hits. I see three hits. Uh, I, I bet you, I bet you that's a good support resistance level to get back in. So if it comes back down here, now's the time to buy. But what happened with each of these hits? If only 20,000 orders got processed here, maybe another 10,000 orders got processed here, 50,000 orders got processed here, 6,000 orders got processed here. So you're actually now reducing your odds because again, resistance or support told me what price did in the past. I need to know what price is going to do in the future. So to carry out this example in that uh, modality, price does come back into this level. And let's say at this point, we placed our buy order. And the moment we got into that buy order, we bought at this level because we were waiting for price to come back to where we saw the ballistic move out. We placed our stop somewhere pr to protect ourselves, to, to limit our, our loss, to limit our, our risk. And then we would have seen where we saw what? A ballistic move down. And we could have set our target somewhere below that. All right. So we could have gotten, say, one, two, three, four, five, six, six or seven or eight R out of that. So if we had 100 bucks worth of risk here, in this example, we would have made uh, 800 bucks based on where price retraced to. All right. So in my book, th there are people different than me that, that, that like to play the odds a little bit, but I only take the first hit. It's kind of like that that cat, or if you touch, if you touch a, a hot uh, stove or my cat actually walked across a hot stove the other day, heard a meow. And I was like, ah, what the heck happened? And he's freaked out and he, he walked across a hot stove and like, that'll learn you stay off that stove. Right? <laughs> so I only want to take that first hit, but you know, you have no idea how many orders are back there because it's, it's invisible. It's behind the green curtain. It's behind the computer, but I can know with a high degree of probability that I can take that first hit. Because if there was a massive amount of orders in there to create that first ballistic move, I can bet you dime the donuts that there's going to be enough orders to give me a profitable trade, at least three to one. So if this is my one, I'm going to go one, two, three. I'm going to at least get three to one out of that trade because of the pattern that I saw uh, earlier there. So yeah, great question. Uh, using support and resistance as as indicators in this particular you know methodology. Now, in this particular example uh, that I took here, this was, um, I can't remember what asset this was, I, I took it off, but there was another hit and then there was another hit and then there was a teeny little hit after that and then it failed, all right? So I just created these numbers you know, down there just for hypothetical reasons, just to show the more times you hit it, uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna see weaker and weaker responses. So there obviously were a lot of orders down here because of that big response. And there were fewer orders over here because of a, of a weaker response and fewer orders over here because of a weaker response. So supply and demand shows itself right there where there's a demand for a product at a particular price. And with a high degree of probability, we can estimate that we can catch that, that next move, almost like the shark and the sucker fish. If you ever see that um, a picture of a shark and a remora, those little sucker fish, uh, the shark is the big boy, right? He takes a bite out of his market. Sorry for this beautiful drawing over here, right? There's the shark. Eh, 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 eh. And what, wh who's the remora? He's that little guy that just sits right under the shark. And, the, and he waits for the shark to take that bite out of his market, whether it's a whale or a swimmer or, you know, whatever. And the little fish gets off, eats all he wants, gets back on and says, where next, Bubba? You know, so, so the, the remora can't take down a whale or a seal, but the shark can. So the remora loves hanging out with the shark. We love hanging out with the institutions. Uh, kind of like, you know, when you're a little kid and, you, you know, you, you, maybe you put on your dad's or your mom's uh, shoes, you know, so little boys be stomping around in their daddy's shoes. I'm a big boy now. Little girls be stomping around in their mother's shoes. I'm a big girl now. That's what we get to do. We don't have billions of dollars to trade, but we can put on the big boy shoes and we can get the same results. So if they bought a hundred thousand shares and made a 50% profit, we can buy a hundred shares and make a 50% profit. So when we follow in their footsteps, it's the same, it's the same thing to go with success or modeling. If you ever took a motivational class and they have this particular, um, you know, recommendation called modeling where do what successful people do and you'll get what successful people got. 
you know, so that's the that's the the motif. You want to be a successful husband, do what good husbands do. You want to be a successful author, do what good authors do. Buy buy books on how to write by successful authors. Uh, Stephen King, one of my favorite authors, and he wrote a book on writing. And um, you know, I'm writing a book, you know, so that kind of thing. And traders, I, I didn't invent anything about trading. I became a good trader because I modeled, I followed successful traders. Okay, so you do what successful people do, you'll get what successful people got. And that's all I want to do is share the same information I got. Um, I heard a great, great quote this weekend from uh, um, the guy that um, wrote the original book uh, or the original screenplay to, to the original movie Alien, the, the you know scariest movie probably in history, you know, rated one of the best science fiction horror films of all time. And Dan Abanan, who is the author, um, someone said, you know, I think he I think he stole from somebody. And he says, I didn't steal from somebody. I stole from everybody. You know, and and that's what that's what we're doing. We're stealing some of the greatest ideas. We're stealing the ideas of these institutions and just playing right along, following uh, right in their footstep. Dan asked a very good question: What's the best time frame to identify supply and demand? Hold that thought, because that's a very good question, and I'm I'm going to cover that. I'm going to cover that in just a little bit, in a hot minute. <laughs> now, one method that people um, who, who trade supply and demand in the past tried to um, utilize this was called the DOM or depth of market. And, and TradingView offers this in their charts. You can see it um, in the lower uh, right hand corner uh, with all the icons. And it's, it's towards the bottom there, depth of market. And this tries to tell you um, how many orders there are in uh, each of these price levels. So you can kind of estimate you know, where supply and demand is. But the problem is, uh, after a little while, the institutions got smart. And what they do is they might have, again, a million shares that they want to buy, but they'll do what's called order pumping. They'll pump out a thousand, pump out a thousand, pump out a thousand, pump out a thousand. And you might be telling yourself, or traders might be telling themselves, man, I can get in here. It's a great opportunity. There's only 82 contracts over there. And then poof, it goes up to 182. And it gets back down to 50. Poof, it goes up to 150. And it's like, darn it, what's going on here? What's happening is the institutions are pumping um, their orders in, and they're not letting you see what's on the bottom of that iceberg. You're only seeing what's on the tip of the iceberg. So what used to be uh, something that was kind of useful that where you actually saw the full amount of orders. People used to pay, I think, like a thousand bucks a month. Um, I could be wrong, but I think they paid, I mean, they paid a lot of money to subscribe to what was called here level two data. Um, and, and now it's useless because they, they use computers to just pump all those orders in and you see a little bit, it's gone and a little bit and it's gone and you have no idea the depth of that market, the true depth of that market. So that's why, again, we need to look at the chart. We don't need to look at how many orders there might be. We need to see what is actually there. And, and take the advice of Master Yoda. We must unlearn what we have learned. And we've learned to use indicators. We've learned to use uh, the depth of market. We've learned um, to use all sorts of interesting tools. But all the information is on the charts. The charts tell a story, and I, and I love now that I can I can I can see how how price moves. Um, and I'm teaching my students um, in my in my trading group, the Saber Trading Group, teaching them how to see it. And it's so amazing that I can't see them in person because we're on, on, on Skype, or not Skype, on a, a Zoom three times a week. But you can hear the little, almost like a little, like a little audible pop in their head, like, oh, I got it, you know, or now I see it. But it really becomes a, a, a profound thing when we think about these institutions like a grocery store, where they're going to buy inventory, say in this case, gasoline. So you might have Exxon Mobil saying, I want to buy, you know, a thousand contracts of gasoline for X. And that thousand contract order is going to drive it up to 10x. You know, in this case, you make a 10R profit. You know, they might have put this much for risk and they made 10R uh, in profit. And so that we, who are we? We bought gasoline for X, we sold gasoline for Y. Um, the charts are telling us where they're going, where price is going over and over and over again. In fact, you could even see little mini levels um, over here. There was a, a book that I had uh, written or written uh, recommend, recommended or did a review on in my um, my trading view um, ideas for education, and it was it was um, by this uh, Italian fella, and it was on price action breakdown where you can see where price 
hits and hits and hits and hits. And you see a little pause there. It hits, it hits, it hits. So that's what he calls control price hits and it hits. So there's a level of control and then there's the zings off of that. So it came up and broke down, came up and broke down, came up, paused. Ooh, now the buyers won. So over here, the sellers were in control and over here, the buyers are in control. And so the, the charts tell a story, you know, it, you can almost, once you learn how to read these charts, you can almost just grab yourself a box of popcorn and just pace yourself through the charts. And, uh, and it's like watching a movie and it's amazing how, how entertaining this is, but also how reliable this is. All right. Now we go back to that example. Um, we, you know, who are we buying that gasoline? Who are we buying wheat? Who are we buying cocoa? Who are we buying a, uh, a, an ETF? Um, these are those institutions. So these institutions are just like big virtual financial warehouses, just like Walmart is a big physical warehouse. And so they need to fill these shelves up at wholesale prices to buy them. And then what do they got to do? They can put them on the shelves and then sell them to their customers. And this is, this is the big thing that we need to, again, twist our brain around to unlearn what we have learned. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate that. It's, uh, this is amazing. This is profound. When I, when, I, when, I pulled, when I looked at this, I was like, is this seriously how this thing works? Because we've been taught for generations that we have to give our money to experts. It's like we've been doing this all our lives. We, when we were kids, what do we do? We, we buy a, a can of uh, lemonade. We set up a little refrigerator box or a little table. And this can of lemonade costs what? $3. And we're selling lemonade for a buck a, a buck a cup. And after the third cup, everything else is pure profit. We bought it wholesale and we're selling it retail. All right. So this is exactly what institutions are. It's just like Walmart, but they have a financial product made of companies, commodities, and currencies as opposed to automotive products, pet products, feminine products, baby products, electronic products. And so we've been taught to be customers because when you go to the store, what do you do? You buy something. And then in any transaction, in any time you go to a store or any type of retail environment, who makes money that day, right? The store, all right? So when we learn to think like these guys where I need to fill these shelves up, I then want to sell these things not be buying them at this retail price, okay? So what we got to do then is come up with this new set of eyes and, and find out where these piles of orders are, all right? So supply and demand isn't a new profound thing in, in terms of the trading world because supply and demand is, 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 is as old as, uh, as, as, as we've done any type of commerce. Um, during some conditions, some guy might sell 50 chickens to, to get somebody's cow, you know, he wants to get some milk. So he has to sell 50 chickens to get a cow. Well, when cows start getting scarce because the winter took out a lot of cows, he might have to give Farmer Joe 75 chickens to buy a cow off of them, to trade off of a cow, All right? So these piles of orders where we see those explosive moves in price um, have to occur in a particular location. They have to look a certain way which is what we call a formation. It has to have a certain form um, and they have to have a good destination. We have to see that that price is gonna, hopefully if price retrace is gonna carry us out to at least three R, if not five or 10 R, that we can make it worth our while. So if I'm gonna put a hundred bucks on the line, it's cause I'm thinking, that, expecting this trade to give me 300 or 500 uh, or a thousand if I'm uh, gonna be successful. And a good trading system will show these opportunities out there. It's, it's all about pattern recognition. And when we get good at seeing these patterns, um, as, as I like to quote Mark Douglas from Trading in the Zone, once you learn to identify patterns, I have this on my mouse pad. I actually made myself a custom mouse pad with my favorite trading quotes. And it's the one right at the top. Once you learn to identify patterns and read the market. So again, read the charts like, 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 like watching a movie you find there are limitless opportunities to make money because we see month after month, year after year, these institutions, these banks, these brokerage houses are making billions of dollars every day. All right. Rain or shine. You know, I don't think they've been hurting a whole lot with the pandemic. You know, the economy, the market oh, the economy sucks, <laughs> but the market's been doing great. All right. So we need to do what they do, not what they've been telling us to do. Kind of like when, when we were kids, you ever hear from your parents, don't do what I do, do what I tell you to do. <laughs> and so we need to do what these institutions do, 
not what they've been telling us to do. So we need to follow in their footsteps. Okay. And, and it's, it really becomes almost like if you remember the first Matrix movie and Neo wakes up in the real world and he walks into Cypher's office or, you know, room, whatever it is, he's looking at the Matrix and it's called Digital Rain. It's all those green characters, you know, flipping, flipping by and, and Neo's like, what are you looking at? You know, I remember the first time you looked at a stock chart or a futures chart and you're like, what's going on in there? You know, and now we're like, oh, there's a place to buy. There's a there's a place to sell. There's a great opportunity to get a, a five to ten R trade. Um, wow, that's a great place to go. And and so just as much as Neo couldn't read the Matrix in the beginning of his you know new birth, and uh, and here's uh, Cipher saying, I don't even see the code anymore. All I see is blonde brunettes, redheads. You know, and so when we look at our charts, it's going to be like, oh, I don't see green and light squiggles anymore. I'm I'm going to see money i'm gonna see opportunity i'm gonna see res i'm gonna see uh that was an institution i'm gonna see ah oh, you know that's that's not a good that's that's a good place to go that's not a good place to go and it's, it's literally gonna just money's just gonna present itself opportunity is just gonna start presenting itself and dan yeah i read that book today trading in the zone yeah trading in the zone. I, I i read that book at least once a quarter or i have the audiobook and i play it in my car and so trading in the zone i have yet to do a, a book review for um, for my trading view account, I did a book review on price action breakdown. So that's a technical book, which I think is one of the most important books out there on, on exactly what we're talking about. Supply and demand trading That's where I learned a lot about what I learned. And then trading in the zone is the psychology, because uh, I don't know if you've seen any of my, my back testing videos, um, or actually I posted it on YouTube. It wasn't, it wasn't in that I, I, I came up with a phrase that, you know, back testing lets you see if the system works. Because there's lots of great trading systems out there. Um, you know, my system, which I call Saber, um, is a very reliable system. It has about an 80% um, hit rate, win rate. Um, there was a young lady who did an, uh, had another live stream scheduled, I think, last week, and and she had a moving average uh, 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 system, which which she said has an 80% win rate. Uh, one of my mentors, as uh, he just launched a class, and and he said, you know, people, students who've taken this class have an average seventy seven percent win rate. So it's one thing to see that the system works. The question is, can you work the system? Because trading is ninety percent psychology. You know, we can we can decide. You know, I'm going to do all the right things. I'm going to do this. But once you're once you actually have money on the table, uh, you can get scared, and that's where the fear of missing out or the fear of loss. Um, can overcome the, the the greed or the desire for gain and you make bad decisions. And it's like, darn it, why didn't I do this? Darn it, why didn't I just follow my plan? And that's why we have to create a plan that follows rules. Um, Dan, the, yeah, the, uh, the book for technical was called Price Action Breakdown. And it's an Italian guy. I can't, I'm not going to try to pronounce his name. Uh, Delaney Lorientau, Lorientau Delantis, I can't remember his name. But if you go to my profile, O Captain, um, which obviously you got to my profile because you're plugged into this uh, webinar uh, to this live stream, um, I have a book review on that book, Price Action Breakdown. So, so we need to follow rules. So, Dan, now I'm going to get into this um, uh, your your question about uh, time frames. So, supply and demand works on every time frame on every product in every asset category because it's a law of the universe, right? So this was a trade that presented itself uh, yesterday um, in gold, all right? So here we have a trade where I, I, I use a, a multi-time frame trading system. So if I'm going to trade on uh, the 15 minute chart, I'm going to be using the one hour chart as my reference time frame. And in my trading system, I, I use um, a, a, a philosophy or the metaphor of being a pirate. And so I want to make sure that the tide is at our back is, is right in the right direction. The wind is at our backs telling me what to do. So the tide and the wind, if you're going to go sailing, tell you everything you're going to do because you, you, you don't want to sail against the tide. It'll 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 you, you, you can't go go forward and you don't want to sail in through a headwind because it's going to blow you backward. I want the wind at my back and I want to be going with the tide. And if the wind is good and the tide is good, I'm going to set sail. I'm going to start looking for opportunity. So here we are on a, on a 15 minute time chart, right? Day trading. And what do we see? We see an explosive move out. And when I talked on my last slide about uh, location, 
um, and formation. This is this is a particular formation that I look for. And I say, this is a high probability trade. I'm going to look to take this trade when price comes back in. And what happened? Price came in at about uh, two hours later. So price presented itself or the opportunity presented itself at 3.30. Price, uh, the trade entered at 5.30. And 3R was achieved at 7. And 10R was achieved at 9. So this was a great trade for day traders following a simple system of supply and demand. Now, for those who are don't want to you know, sit in front of their computers for a couple hours at a time or can't because they have a day job, you can do some swing trading, right? So your base time frame that you would be trading on would be the hourly time frame and your reference time frame to see what the weather is like would be the four hour time frame. So again, I want to see that I'm in a good tidal position. The tide is rising and the wind is at our backs, meaning the RSI is increasing at each pivot high. So I have a high probability that of, of winning uh, in a long uh, situation, All right? So now I'm looking for longs. So on the hourly chart, if I'm going to be a swing trader, I'll just check my computer maybe twice or three times a day if because I'm looking doing swing trading. I see at this time frame, um, I saw the, the level that I'm looking at, the formation and the location, and I have a good destination because at this time we're at all time highs, so the sky's the limit. And price came back in and it immediately, uh, within one hour, it technically only happened in, in, in like five minutes, uh, it went up 5R. And then uh, you could have just put a target for 3R and then you know if you're right 50% of the time, you're, you got a great, uh, a great uh, profit ratio there. But it eventually achieved 6.7R if you used uh, trade management rules, if you actually did uh, sit in front of your computer and do like a technical trailing stop. Now say you're not a swing trader, say you you don't want to spend even uh, every day, you know, maybe just once a week, you decide that you're going to look for opportunities. You're just trading your portfolio, right? You're retired, you got money, you just want to see your portfolio grow. Well, then you go to a daily chart. So if you traded once a week, say you traded on a Monday, you'll be looking at the daily charts, but you'll be also looking at the tide and the wind, where? On the weekly charts. So on the weekly charts, we see the tide is rising, pivot high, pivot high, pivot high. Uh, we see that the wind is at our backs, uh, 52, 63. And by the way, this is a, this, uh, is a free indicator that I wrote uh, for the trading view community, zigzag, high, low, plus the RSI. And um, that just lets me know, should I be looking for longs or should I be looking for shorts? And if the market's going sideways or if the RSI is wonky, like say at this pivot high, it goes down to 52 and 52 is less than 63. I'm not, I'm not going sailing today. You know, I need, I need clear and compelling uh, traits or a clear and compelling environment. Just like if I'm going to go sailing and I'm going to get my jet ski out, um, which I love to jet ski. I trade in the morning and when the weather is nice, it's not nice now. I try to jet ski uh, in the afternoons. I need to make sure the weather's good, right? So right now I'm also looking for longs, but again, on the daily chart, I see a pattern. I see a location. I see a destination. So I got those three things that I was looking for that I, I referenced on the previous slide. Price traces back in on 612. So the level presented itself on 528. So two weeks later, the trade enters. And then another, let's see, three and a half weeks later, price hits our three R target. And then if you decided to do a technical trailing stop, you move your stop, you move your stop, you move your stop, and you move your stop, and then you get stopped out on nine three. So this system, supply and demand, whether you're using my particular system, Sabre, or Laurentiis's uh, system that he outlines in um, Price Action Breakdown, or any number of systems, as long as the system is based on supply and demand, you can trade any product on any time frame um, uh, for any reason or in, in, in every asset class. You can trade Bitcoin using supply and demand. I actually had a really good Bitcoin uh, trade example. I don't trade Bitcoin, but I went to the Bitcoin futures and I think it was November 4th when the first level hit and then it was just technical trailing stop after technical trailing stop and it went like 47 to 1. So someone wanted Bitcoin. Someone created a huge demand for Bitcoin, which drove the price up 47R. And then a couple weeks later, 
there was another, I think it was like 20, 24 R, you know? So all we got to do is, is see um, how markets move, start, start letting the charts tell us a story and, and see where the fights between the buyers and the sellers, where the fights between the institutions and the banks, where the, the fights between the brokers and their customers. Because again, a broker is going to want to buy it wholesale. And when price is going up and price is going up, they'll tell their customer, hey, man, you don't want to miss out, man. Price is moving. You better buy. They buy. And they're happy for a little while as price goes up. But what happened when price goes below their, their, their purchase price? The buyer gets freaked out and says, oh, man, I need to get out of this thing. I'm losing money. And the broker's like, yeah, you're right. That sucks. Sucks to be you. Um, you know, let's get you out of that. I'll, I'll be happy to buy it back from you. And what price did they buy it back at? Wholesale. And they just sell it to somebody else, right? So we need to be the wholesaler, retailer, not the customer. And when we learn that, and when we learn how to see these charts with new eyes, like Neo started to see the matrix, uh, it'll change our life. It'll change our, our trading life, all right? So the big benefits or the big takeaways of supply and demand trading, why, why use nothing but price action? All right, we, we just want to look at nothing but the charts. Number one, it's based on reality. The charts tell us what the institutions are doing, not what they've already done. For instance, those indicators, again, they're lagging indicators. They, they tell us old information. I need to predict the future of price movement, not look at the past of what had already happened in price movement. Another big benefit is we don't have to watch the news. I don't have to watch CNBC. I don't have to listen to uh, Fortune magazine. I don't have to look at any talking heads. In fact, I, I turned television off in 1993. I'm not going to do the math and try to figure out how many years ago that was. <laughs> but after the first Gulf War, that's when it was. Uh, my wife and I, you know, it was the first televised war, right? We were watching uh, missiles going down chimneys and stuff. It was just an incredible time. But man, it was it was it was it was aware on, on our brains. And we're like, hey, honey, let's take a month off. Woof, man, we need a break. And after the first month, we were like, wow, that was pretty cool. Let's do it again. And we took a second month with no television. And we're like, wow, this is working out really good. I guess we don't need to have television anymore. And we cut the cord. You know, way before the word cord cutting <laughs> was a thing. Uh, we cut the cord back in 1993. Now I do watch movies. I have a I have a killer home theater upstairs, 144 inch screen, surround sound that'll blow your ears out. That's probably why I have to wear hearing aids now <laughs> at, at 49 years old. Um, but you don't need to use the news. Or it's strictly price action. So it saves you all the time and all the heartache and or or heartburn of trying to figure out what to do. Um, the third, and I've, I've mentioned this several times now, supply and demand works on every market, on every time frame, on every product for every trading purpose. So you can trade uh, swing trades on Forex. You can do, um, you can do uh, day trades in futures. You can do scalping on stocks. You know, so whatever you want to do, uh, as long as you can learn how to look at the predictive nature of these patterns, you can follow the same patterns on every time. I traded the one minute candles just to say that I could. And 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 I was able to trade for a while, for about a week, because then I went crazy because like there was just alarms and alerts popping up everywhere. Um, but I traded the one minute candles just to see if this actually still worked, to see if my trading system, Sabre, uh, worked. Because I, I tested it on the 15. I tested it on the hour. I tested it on the daily. I said, you know, just for curiosity, I wonder if I could trade the one minute candles. And I could. That was pretty crazy. Um, and Dan, great point. The news comes out after the move happened, right? So it's like, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm glad you told me that IBM just went up 20 points, but that would have been nice to know 30 minutes ago and I could have bought some IBM. <laughs> you know? So so yeah, that there's not a single thing that comes out of the newscaster's mouth makes us money. All it, all it tells us is what has already happened. Because it had to have already happened, and it already had to go through several, um, several other, you know, channels before it finally got to your ears on whatever cable uh, service or internet service it is. Um, the next benefit of supply and demand is trading by rules. By by hearing the news, you wonder. By by looking at the statistics or the price to earnings ratios or um, you know history, it's like you wonder. There's just a bunch of uncertainty when you're trading on, you know, the fundamentals. When you're trading on the technicals, it's just like pulling. It's just like pulling the um, 
uh, the arm uh, of a slot machine at Las Vegas. You're not stressed like, oh, should I pull the arm all the way? Should I should I put a quarter in now or should I wait 15 minutes and then put a quarter in it? And when I put the quarter in, should I should I flip that lever right away or should I pull it really slowly? It's like, uh, you know, you don't do that. You just put the quarter in, pull the thing, put the quarter in, pull that one arm bandit, you know, and you do it again and again because, you know, the statistically you're going to make X amount of money when you have a system that has X amount of return. So if you have a system that has a 50 percent probability and every trade a 50 percent win rate and you have a system that you your win rate is always at least three to one. What happens? It's just like flipping a coin. You win three, you lose one. You win three, you lose one. You lose one. You win three, you lose one. You win seven, you lose one. And it becomes amazing. You just start placing trade after trade after trade after trade because you just see, oh, there's a trade. There's a trade. Just like, oh, there's a blonde. There's a brunette. There's a redhead like Cypher in the Matrix. You're just going to see these opportunities based on supply and demand. And it's beca it's become stress-free. I think that's the biggest benefit of... Um, of, uh, of supply and demand just as just for your own self as a person is uh, to trade without emotion to trade like a Vulcan. I say trade like Spock trade long and prosper. Right. <laughs> and uh, and and then uh, and then you just keep trading uh, again and again and again. Uh, professionals learn how to trade what they see now what they are. Yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, the phrase I heard from some of my mentors was trade what you see, not what you feel. And, um, and I have a friend, one of my best friends, my trading buddy, um, it took me a long time to pull him out of that ditch of emotion because he's like, oh, but I got a good feeling about this. Oh, but this, uh, this thing and oh, but you know, and I was like, stop saying, oh, you know, you're, you're going, oh, oh, oh. And it's like, you're using emotion. What did the chart tell me? Look at that wick. Look at that third candle. Look, it's not a leg. It's a base, but, but it's like, no buts just trade based on our rules. And once he finally did that, then he started becoming profitable. In fact, this morning, he, we were texting this morning. He couldn't trade with me this morning. Um, we trade via Zoom. And he said, uh, yeah, I've got this thing happening with my family. I can't trade today. But man, I, three, three, uh, three, three, three green days in a row, man. I'm happy. It's like, love it, man. And it's so good to hear him because, uh, say that because in the beginning, he was so frustrated because of his emotions. Um, benefits of supply and demand, also high probability. When you learn how to do this, it's just like, you know, Walmart doesn't lose money, you know, overall. You know, they might have a product or something that they just got to put on clearance and get it off their shelves. But overall, they're buying at wholesale, selling at retail. And once in a while, they'll take a loss. But overall, they're getting those wins, which is why every time I get a 1R loss, I don't care. I, it, that emotion stays away because I know my next 3R win will take care of it. All right. And so you don't have to be super duper. You Even if the system has an 80% win rate, you don't have to have an 80% win rate to be a profitable trader. And to be a profitable trader, I mean, that's you're going to be beating 90% of the people out on the market who are not profitable traders. And I can only imagine if, if 9 out of 10 people don't make money, why? Because they don't have rules. They get emotional. All right. And, and another great benefit of supply and demand, as you saw with those three examples I gave earlier, you only need one screen. When I first started trading, um, I uh, I had I had six monitors, well not six, well five really. I had my three main monitors. I had a laptop, and then I plugged in my iPad as a secondary monitor, and just had all this stuff here. My, my room got hot. I had to put an air conditioning unit in the window, and the HOA got all upset at that, and and it's just all this crazy stuff. And now because it's so calm and so relaxing, um, I only need one screen. I, I just need that one screen to show me on the left hand side the tide and the wind, and then the right hand side where the waves are. And I just place my trades off of that one screen. I can trade off my tablet now. The last update to the um, iPad Pro, iOS uh, 12, I think it is. Uh, iOS 12 has desktop class browsing now. So I can do trading view on my iPad. And I was like, wow, a year ago, I couldn't have done this. You know, so it's just now, now I can actually feel good just going somewhere to a restaurant. And if I need to monitor a trade, I can monitor it uh, just by bringing my iPad. I could use my phone too, but I don't, I wouldn't want to use my finger on my phone like that, <laughs> but it's so cool to just limit yourself to just one, one screen. And lastly, benefit is um, quoting that Mark Douglas quote again. Once you learn to identify patterns and read the market, you find there are limitless opportunities to make money. And so like Mark Douglas says, um, there is endless opportunity, you know, and I trade typically the 15 minute time frames, and, and sometimes you don't see any opportunities. It's like, it's a slow day in the market or we're in the doldrums. So what do you do? 
let's go to the five minute and let's trade the 515 instead of the 15, 15, 60. And uh, gosh darn it, we're going to find some opportunities in there. So it is, it is literally a sea of ebbing and flowing of, uh, of finding these opportunities out there. Um, Ishan, uh, how do you find demand and supply zones and what is the uh, stop loss zone? You know, that's a great question. And as I mentioned earlier, um, there are plenty of, of systems out there. Uh, the system that I developed uh, over, you know, four years of trading and uh, actively trading and actively learning. I, I, I used to trade on a three panel system. I had three time frames, uh, kind of like, um, I think the guy's name was Alexander Elder, the, 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 the founder or pioneer of, of triple time frame analysis. So you might trade the 15 minute, the hourly, and then the 240, or you might trade the 240 daily and weekly. Um, you know, that's how I learned how to trade using supply and demand. And I had refined it to myself um, to a, a two panel system. And so my system is called Sabre. And so three days a week, I have I have a group, the Sabre Trading Group, um, which you can find on my profile if you're interested. It's down there at the bottom um, of every one of my articles in my signature file, uh, join my trading group. Um, but I go over the system that I created, which I call Sabre. I say Sabre like a sword, it cuts through the noise of the financial markets. And so it's just very simple, very rules-based. And we trade uh, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And, um, and, and, and just find opportunities to, to make money. And we do like weekly recaps and, and stuff like that. But you can go, um, yeah, Dr. Elder right there, trading for a living. So these, these guys show uh, how they do their method of supply and demand. The, the book I mentioned earlier, Price Action Breakdown, um, that gentleman, the Italian fellow had, had a system. Like once you learn supply and demand, here's how you can create a system. And, and the thing I love about my system is it's not like a red light, green light, oh, take a trade. I, I like that Sabre actually teaches you how to be a trader. I don't even like calling you know, what I've got an indicator. I just call it a highlighter because you can just see it there on the chart. The price action's right there on the chart. But sometimes it can be taxing on the brain to be looking at candle after candle after candle. I'm like, just just give me the spotlight. It's almost like uh, like when you're in predator mode. You put on the predator glasses and you see the you see, you see the infrared footsteps of your prey. And so really that's that's all that is doing. So it's not something that you just uh, slavishly uh, take a trade because the indicator told you to take a trade. No, mine is more like a highlighter where I teach supply and demand. And then we just highlight where the opportunities are and we have to make trading decisions based on that. So it's, it's not, you know, like, a, I don't know, a lot of people sell indicators, um, but I don't sell indicators. I, I wanna teach my people how to become traders. So uh, yeah, Dr. Elder, trading for a living. In fact, I think I got that, uh, yeah, right here, trading, trading for a living, <clears throat> right here on my psychology, trading tactics and money management. Yeah, how to become a cool, calm and collected trader and, uh, and how to develop a powerful trading system. So again, my system, which, um, you know, it took me four years to, to, to develop the system I got now. Um, and it, it works great. And I, I'm, I, I learned from other people's systems and refined them and back tested them to death, which is why I'm so passionate about back testing. Um, and uh, Dan, yes, uh, I left my, my URL is right there, tradingview.com slash captain, basically my profile page where you plugged into this um, uh, live stream. And uh, you can you can actually see in the footer, um, I have a link to uh, my trading group. So it's, uh, it's like you want more information. I sell spreadsheets. I have um, uh, some training as well as um, my weekly uh, or thrice weekly group. And so like I say, we meet Monday and Friday at 9 a.m. Eastern time and Wednesday at uh, 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern time too. So yeah, if you're interested in joining our group, I, I say trade like a pirate. So you're part of our crew. And uh, every week we go through our strategy and we just find trade after trade after trade. And, and that, what I love the best is when my students or when my crew gives me their screenshots. Uh, what did I do wrong? How could I have done better? Is this a good trade? And, and so we look for setups. And so then we're, we're actively doing that. And that's what that's the hardest part about becoming a trader. As we see with supply and demand, trading is easy or trading is simple, right? But that mental process, becoming a trader is the hard part. So what Dr. Elder talks about in trading for a living, what um, uh, Mr. Tharp says in trading in the zone, uh, it's all about psychology. You know, it's, it's like 90% psychology. Y you can find a system that works, but can you work the system? Can you get your emotions um, out of that system? And, uh, and whether you're using the Sabre system, whether you come up with your own system, uh, as long as you're using supply and demand, you're trading 
reality. You're trading with the institutions. You're trading with the people that are making those markets move. Um, just like if you were on a wakeboard, the boat is doing all the work, right? Creating that big trench in the water and you get on the wakeboard and you're just surfing along. And that's exactly what we do as uh, supply and demand traders. So, uh, so yeah, Dan, if, uh, if you or anyone else are inspired and would like to join our uh, crew, as I, I like to call it, the HMS Opportunity, uh, feel free. I would love to have you join our group and, and trade with us uh, tomorrow. I mean, to, oh, not tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. Uh, wow, my time flies, right? Tempest Fugits. <laughs> so tomorrow is Friday. Um, or uh, just keep on uh, plugging on and, and read some of those books and learn more about the markets because the markets are very predictable because they're made by people who have patterns, patterns of buying at wholesale and selling at retail, just like the grocery store, just like Walmart. That's exactly how these big institutions do it. They leave footprints in the sand that we can look at on the charts and we just gotta follow the money and follow the opportunity. Well, it's hard enough for an Italian to say that uh, he's out of breath. <laughs> so uh, it's been wonderful uh, uh, performing this live stream and uh, sharing it with you. Thank you for all of your input. Um, if anyone has any final questions, I'm happy to hang around as long as you need to um, to uh, to uh, uh, answer any of your questions. And this has been a pleasure. And, um, and for, for my first time uh, doing a, a test um, um, uh, stream here for the trading view community because I know they're still working the bugs out uh, of the streaming system. I think it could become a wonderful tool for us uh, all here on trading view. Um, okay, dread. What's the minimum trading capital required? Great question. Um, it takes money to make money, right? So in the trading world, um, just like well, just like in the in the in the um, in the real world. If you were going to um, say open up a Jiffy Loop, you know you're, you're going to or or Dunkin' Donuts, you know you might need say a half a million dollars in capital, and then you're paying say fifteen thousand dollars a month on that loan. But your restaurant or whatever it is you bought into is giving you say sixty thousand dollars a month in in cash flow, so you're using a little bit of money to make a lot of money, right? So in trading, if you want to really figure out like a particular number, like how can I make $500 a week, okay? Or, or how can I make a hundred bucks a day? You, you gotta, you, you just kind of backstep the whole thing and say, okay, if I'm right 50% of the time, so I'd lose one and make three on a three to one trading system. Uh, or let's say you're not that good. Let's say you're only right one out of three times, all right? So let's say you lose one, lose one, make three. So you grow by one R every day. If you wanted to make a hundred bucks a day, 500 bucks a week, in order to do that, if you're going to do good risk management protocol, um, you're going to want to have you're going to want to risk no more than one percent of your account. All right. So if you're going to risk no more than one percent of your account, following your rules, to make a hundred bucks a day, you need ten thousand dollars because ten thousand uh, dollars, one percent is a hundred bucks a day. So if you had three trades a day that you only had a, a thirty-three percent win rate. Um, because you're you're still learning, you would lose a hundred, lose a hundred, make three hundred, and then you you grew by a hundred bucks. You you grew your account by one percent that day. Now the good news is that if you keep that money in there, then you're compounding your money. All right. So week one, you might be trading a hundred uh, as far as your one percent risk. Uh, week two, you might be trading $102. Week three, $107. Week four, $112. So the more you trade, the more you grow, the more that 1% risk factor comes into play where you can you can grow your goals. So the other, the other factor is, you know, say if you only had $5,000, but you still wanted to make 100 bucks a day. Well, you either need to up your win rate. So you're, say if you're right 50% of the time, you lost one R, you made three R. So you netted two, 50 bucks times two is a hundred bucks. So you're still making a hundred bucks a day, but you're doing it because you are now becoming better at your system. Okay. So that's a great question. And, and, um, and as far as like the minimum capital required, I mean, you can open up a, a Forex account for a hundred bucks, right? But 1% risk is a dollar. So you're going to risk a dollar to make $3. You're not going to make a lot of capital. However, you are going to learn and, and, and if you lose it, if you put a dollar on the line, and you lose a dollar, you've lost real money. And so like, oh, that really hurt. I lost a dollar. You know, it, it doesn't hurt like losing a thousand dollars, but it adds a, a group of reality to it. 
And Forex is a great market to, to, to trade live in with small amounts of capital because you really can't do that in the futures market. In the futures market, you are going to lose 50 bucks, 100 bucks, maybe 250 bucks um, because you just need that much more capital. With, to, to just begin the trade, not even saying how much money you could make, um, in the futures market, you probably need about $5,000 in your account because every time you open up a position, it's taking up margin. So you might only still risk a hundred bucks, but you needed four thousand bucks to place an S and P trade. You needed eighteen hundred bucks to place a euro trade. You needed um, seventeen hundred dollars to open up a British pound trade. So um, the physicality, just like with a stock, you know, for, to buy fifty shares of a hundred dollar stock, um, you need five thousand dollars in your account to do that. And then how much money do you want to make every day? So that's when you got to figure out your risk and your reward and and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so great, great question there. What's the minimum trading capital required? Um, just a hundred bucks to open up a Forex account. But, but when you ask yourself, how much money do I want to make? You've got to back, you've got to backfill that. Say, if I want to make a hundred bucks a day, I got to backfill that to, I need to do three trades a day minimum and win one out of three. If I'm only, you know, right 30% of the time. And then how much capital do I need in that account? So great, great question for the group. Um, do you trade major swings on supply and demand Maverick? Uh, personally, no. Uh, personally, I trade uh, the 15 minute time frame. So my work day um, typically runs from uh, 6 a.m. to about 11-ish a.m. So, um, and, and if I have a couple winning trades early on, I'm done. I mean, I can, I can finish my day at 8 a.m. I could finish my day at you know, 11 a.m. You know, it, 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 I just want to you know, find opportunities. But what I said here on these three slides, whether you trade in the 15 minute for day trading, 60 minute for swing trading, daily for uh, long-term trading, um, supply and demand style trading works on every time frame in any asset. You can trade futures. Uh, you can trade Forex, you can trade stocks, you can trade options, which are basically stock trades. You're just using the options vehicle. You can trade Bitcoin um, using supply and demand trading. So that's that's the one of the beauties of it is once you learn how to trade supply and demand, you can trade any product. So I was considering opening up a Forex account. I do have a Forex account, but I moved all my capital into my futures account. But just to say that I do it and, and perhaps put maybe like a thousand bucks in there, um, and swing trade. So I'll use Forex for swing trading and futures for day trading, you know, so that I was considering doing that. Um, but do I personally do it Maverick? No, but, but can you do it? Absolutely. Um, you can swing trade a uh, long-term trade. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm in the Lake Norman area, just North of Charlotte, North Carolina. And I, I'm, I'm the, I organize a, a meetup group out here, uh, called Lake Norman traders. And so we get together like once a quarter or something, just at a restaurant, we just talk shop. We just enjoy each other's company. We don't, we don't trade together. Um, but, I, but there's a gentleman there in the group who trades the, 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 the quarterly charts. He, I didn't even know you can get a three month chart, but he, he actually trades the three month chart. You talk about patience, you know, and he's a supply and demand trader. All right. So he knows where the big money is where the big money is uh, moving that price into levels of wholesale and then driving that price back down to levels of uh, uh, driving up to levels of retail and driving price back down to levels of wholesale. So great question there. Um, yeah, great question. Uh, let's see, where can we find your indicator and strategy? Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, at the end of uh, the main presentation, uh, you can find it at um, my my profile at the top of uh, this. Uh, ooh, sorry, just uh, running out of breath. <laughs> uh, you can find it on my profile uh, and at the bottom of my signature. In fact, I might as well just go ahead and do that um, right here on uh, Trader Row Captain. Go to my profile. So right here in my profile there, trading the system three times a week, join our trading group. Um, but also at the bottom of every article in the uh, signature file, there's also a link down there. So appreciate you asking. And, uh, and we have a lot of fun and it's so rewarding. I mean, I, I had one guy um, last week, he was like, uh, he posted a trade to the group and he was like, uh, this was great. But the, the most exciting thing about this was I found it myself, you know? So it's not like I'm 
you know, just handing out again, a, a red light, green light, you know, this is when you buy, this is when you sell. I'm teaching people how to trade. I'm teaching supply and demand, just like I learned from, from my mentors, from my trainers, from my books that I've read and all of that. So it's, it's a, it's a great privilege to, uh, uh, be able to do that as well to to pass to pass it on uh, to what do you think I'll pay it forward. All right, so I don't see any more questions in the group. So um, I appreciate everyone's questions. This was a wonderful time. I think it was a wonderful experience for um, uh, for for the Trading View um, uh, leadership too, because they do uh, want to see more activity happening in these streams, having quality content uh, coming up in in the streams here. For the trading view community but uh, right now it's still in beta and uh, i think as we start um uh getting some more uh experienced uh, i guess they call them broadcasters get some more experienced broadcasters out here creating some uh quality content it's gonna really take off and they'll take it out of beta and just make it more uh, available to everybody um oh yeah another question here ali um i like to lower time frames one minute and five minute yeah like i said um you know if i go back to uh, my charts here. I'll just go say pull up, pull up anything. I'll go. It's hard. To, it's hard to trade the lower time frames on things that don't have a lot of volume. All right. So it's it's real tough to say trade agricultures and meats because say you go to um, uh, feeder cattle. If you go to the five minute and then the fifteen minute, say you're going to trade that way. Um, well, feeder cattle actually isn't that bad. It doesn't look that bad. But let's say wheat. Um, yeah, when you get down to certain certain assets, the charts get really choppy. Um, the bonds are the same way. The bonds are not good uh, to trade in the uh, lower time frames because they get really blocky and really choppy. So, so bonds, I actually <clears throat> do bump up to the hourly. So if you go to the 60 and then the 240, I'm looking for the same patterns. I'm looking for the same result. I'm looking for the same R, um, but but the charts are just much more fluid and much more uh, dynamic. And in fact, here's here's a level right here. So in this uh, area here, we were in an uptrend. We um, had an increasing RSI, so the wind was at our back, and that little uh, indicator there, or I call it my highlighter, highlighted that opportunity. And here we are in the one hour time frame in the bond market, all right? So we could have done a technical stop. We could have done a technical stop. We could have done a technical stop. And then we, got, we would have gotten stopped out here. So uh, right un, under that tick. So that's a 7.2 trade on the hourly time frame. all right? So no matter what product or no matter what uh, time frame in whatever um, product category, futures, forex, or stocks, uh, supply and demand works no matter what strategy. You know, this is again my strategy, the saber strategy. Um, but when you get down to the one minute, so now go to bonds. <laughs> Just to answer, uh, go back to uh, Ali's question here. Go to the one minute, five minute. Which again, I did trade the one minute, five minute, but I was limited to what I could trade because then they get all junky. I mean, that is just a disgusting looking chart. <laughs> uh, I couldn't imagine, you know, trying to find. I mean, but what's funny is is it still works. These these actually still uh, work even though they even though they look ugly. Um, I'm trying to find an example right off the top here, but yeah, I just can't find it. I have to go looking. But anywho, um, all that to say is uh, yeah, as long as the charts look good, you just have to have the good uh, liquidity. Because what's happening volume wise is um, you know you got these things trading a couple hundred less than a hundred contracts per uh, candle. And so you, you want a little more liquidity than that. You know, you go to gold and gold is doing, you know, probably four or five times what the bonds are doing. Uh, you go to the indexes and obviously, you know, 6,000 uh, contracts uh, trading in the S&P futures market, you know, in some some cases. So um, so liquidity is very important. That's that's another um, aspect of of uh, what would you trade and why would you trade it is it needs to be liquid. You know, for instance, for me to trade anything in the futures, that's why I have my, I call these my 31 flavors. I trade my 31 flavors in the futures market um, and they all trade at least 10,000 contracts a day uh, and have X amount of volatility. So price actually moves, meaning there is opportunity because, you know, you don't want price just sitting there. We only make money when price moves, right? So you need so much volatility. And so that's how I came up with my 31 flavors. With Forex, when I trade uh, Forex, 
I trade the USD pairs and the Euro pairs. I don't touch anything else because the spread's higher and uh, the movement's not as good. And here you've got uh, yeah, the Euro, 160,000, 270,000, 60,000 um, contracts. Here's the pound New Zealand, 225. That's not bad. So yeah, pound uh, pairs are pretty good too. But you need liquidity and you need um, uh, movement uh, in order to get <clears throat> in, in and out at the price you want without getting a lot of slippage or not getting an adequate fill. Um, I traded oil, no oil, I traded silver a couple of weeks ago. I wanted nine contracts. I only got filled for three and I was so upset because it went 10 R and I was like, ah, darn it. I mean, I could have made two weeks worth of profit in one day, but I ended up made, making just, you know, a day's profit because I only got filled on three contracts and, and not, uh, oh, not, not 13. I wanted 13 contracts of silver because, uh, um, because that was my, my risk, uh, management there, but yeah, I only got filled on a fraction of it. So I only made a fraction of my profit on a, on a wonderful trade. <laughs> so, uh, so cool. All right. So I think that's all the questions we have and, uh, that's all the time I have and all of the, uh, content that I have. So thank you very much. As I like to tell my people trade strong, trade safe, trade well, and, um, hopefully we'll see you, uh, on, on the HMS opportunity. If you decide to, uh, join, our, our trading uh, club. Otherwise, we'll see you on Trading View and um, keep on posting the ideas. All right. Y'all take care and have a wonderful day. And if I don't uh, hear from anybody uh, before then, have a wonderful Christmas uh, next week and enjoy the week off.